Good morning. Welcome to Kingston West Free Methodist Church. Uh, to all the mums listening in today, and my mum will probably be one of them, happy Mother's Day. And thank you for your love, your support uh, in all of our lives. I know this Mother's Day uh, for many of you will be uh, maybe a little bit different, especially if your kids are no longer at home. Instead of seeing your children in person, uh, you'll be seeing them via video calls or through telephone conversations. And I want you to know that you are loved and appreciated every day of the year, not just one day of the year. Good morning, everyone. I just want to introduce this video to you quickly. It's from Barry and Melissa Somerville, and they are going to share about the ministry to which God has call, is calling them to. And they met with the board at Kingston West in early March, just before we had to go into this isolation with this uh, pandemic. And of course, if they haven't been able to share at church uh, what they're doing. So I asked them to put together this video to share with you so that you can know what they're doing and so that you can also be a part of what they're doing by praying for them, first and foremost, but also the opportunity to support them financially. The Kingston West Board did set up a designated fund uh, for this. Uh, you can designate it just by putting LL Ministries and it will go to help with their support. And so, if you have any questions about this at all, please talk to Daryl Dean, and he will give you any of the information, or you can talk to me as well, and I can direct you accordingly. So, take it away, Barry and Melissa. God bless. Morning, everybody. Uh, most of you know us, but uh, just in case you don't, um, I'm Melissa and this is my husband Barry. Um, we just got married in December and are here today to share a little bit about what's going on in our lives since then. And Barry's going to share a little bit deeper shortly, but um, I just wanted to thank the board at Kingston West for asking us to um, share with them quite a few weeks ago and Pastor Bond for asking us if we wanted to do a little video to update everybody. and. Um, we had met with the board before COVID started and then before we could plan a Sunday mm -hmm. um, to share at church, everything was then shut down. So here we are um, and I'll let Barry continue from here. Thanks, honey. So good morning, everyone. So I'm going to share where God has called me and where he is leading us in this season as we follow him. Over the past four years, God has been building me, equipping me, and preparing me for a step of faith, a step into L Ministries. God has confirmed this in so many ways. Isaiah 61 says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, and to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. This verse was a confirmation verse that has come up continually over the years at specific times that often were related and in, in relation to LL. Yeah, so um, for those of you who maybe have never heard about LL, um, LL is an international nonprofit Christian ministry, um, and actually it's in Westport, Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, and LL really helps the body of Christ find healing and grow deeper um, as they walk with God. And LL offers numerous retreats and schools. LL comes alongside the church um, and equips and builds up pastors, ministry leaders, and the church body as a whole. So how did I get to know LL? In 2015, I was in a tough place in my walk with God. I had been a Christian for about five years and I was saved. I had given over my life to God, 
My life had turned around from what it used to be, but I was not living life abundant. I did not know my identity and who I was in Christ fully. I did not hear God. I was scared to talk to him at times and I had so much build up hurt from my past that it stopped me from truly hearing my Heavenly Father. Little did I know that there could be more to it than just being saved and believing in God. God led me to Sterling and Faye DeWolf, who many of you may know. Sterling and Faye had gone through the teaching and training from LL Ministries because of them listening to the Holy Spirit's leading they approached me and asked if I would like to step into a deeper healing with the Lord which took me about three weeks to say yes to that was one of the best decisions I could have ever made in my walk with Christ God started my healing journey through Sterling and Fay, and not long after that, the LL Discipleship School came to Robin Wesleyan Church. Somebody sponsored me to attend the school, and that began a more intimate walk with Jesus and a huge growth in my discipleship. Through different church communities, Sterling and Fay and LL, I now realize God's purpose for my life. I now know the love of my Heavenly Father and that I am His Son. And it is an incredible journey and I can't wait to see what He has next. I would like to ask you to join us. Would you all partner with us in prayer? Pray for us as I work at LL full time and navigating through the challenges and changes with COVID and how we are moving forward through it all. Pray for us as this is our first year of marriage. We also need prayer to see God's kingdom move forward in only ways that he can do. The second way you can partner with us is by monthly financial support. Working at LL means you raise your own funds and at this time I am continuing to serve at LL for one year. Would you prayerfully consider supporting us in this way as the Lord prompts you? I just want to end this with saying this. I know that me not stepping out into LL this year and going back to my job, providing for Melissa and I in what is a comfortable and normal way for me would be complete disobedience. My mom used to look up Bible schools and universities because she knew that I wouldn't ever be happy without living out God's call for my life. God has confirmed LL to me and to us in so many ways that we are trusting him. Trusting him with our first year of marriage and mi mixing full-time ministry. Trusting him with provision and trusting him that he is going to use me and us to fulfill his purposes for our lives according to his plans. Yeah, so um, if you'd like more information about what we've kind of discussed here, um, we'd be really happy to talk with you about it. And uh, you can contact us at 613-329-8259. Um, we would love to chat and uh, answer any questions you may have. So. Um, thank you all so much. Mm -hmm. um, we pray you're all 
safe and healthy and we really can't wait to see you all again. So thank you. Bye. Just one announcement is uh, that next Sunday we're going to actually have a guest speaker. And I know it's somebody that you love and you love hearing him come and share. And it's uh, uh, Reverend Steve Coy from Geneva House on the Queen's campus. And he's prepared a message that uh, he's going to share next Sunday. He said he wanted to give me a Sunday off. So very appreciative of him for doing that. So today, as we begin our time, I want to begin with a call to worship from Psalm 138. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple, and I will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. When I called, you answered me. You made me bold and stout-hearted. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you as we gather to worship you today. We thank you for all the mums. We thank you for the blessing that they are to each and every one of us. I pray you would encourage them and you would encourage each and every one of us as we open up your word. May your Holy Spirit have the freedom to move in our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading uh, today comes from 1 John chapter 4, verses uh, 1 to 21. Again, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. First section is entitled, Discerning False Prophets. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if they have the Spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the Spirit of the Antichrist which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's point of view. And the world listens to them. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us if they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. Next section is entitled Loving One Another. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loves us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the son of God have God living in them and they live in God. We know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear if we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. 
We each, we love each other because he loved us first. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people, how can we uh, love God, whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. So if you ask most people what their favorite book of the Bible is, I would suspect that you might not get a lot of votes for the book of 1 John. You know, books like Romans or, or James or the Gospel of John, they tend to be more popular. However, you might have been surprised as I read today's text. I imagine that you probably recognize quite a few verses. I mean, if there was a greatest hits package for the Bible, 1 John would be well represented, especially chapter 4 here. If you grew up in the church, you've heard them all your life, such as verse 4, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Verse 7, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Verse 15, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in him and he in God. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. Verse 21, and he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. I mean, this is a great chapter. It's it's foundational in our understanding of what it means to live the Christian life. This chapter defines the standard that God expects us to live by. And there are three things that I want you to notice in this text today. Number one, God sets the standard for what love is. Now, have you noticed that we have a lot of voices around us these days trying to define what love is and what it's not? I mean, we see it in TV shows and movies we watch. We see it in social media. We hear people on the news trying to define what love should really look like. Well, in verse 10, John tells us what real love is. This is real love. It is not that we loved God, but that he loved us. See, real love is not defined by what a person does, but by what God has done. You know, recently, when Prince Harry recently surrendered all his rights as a prince so that he and Meghan can live life as they desire, this is a great example of human love. When Elizabeth Elliot went to the jungles of Ecuador to preach the gospel to the tribe who murdered her husband, that was really a great example of Christian love. When people gather on their front porches and balconies to make noise to thank the people working on the front lines, that is an expression of grateful love. When people gather in large convoys of vehicles to drive by the homes of those who lost their lives in Nova Scotia to to pay their respect. That is an outpouring of compassionate love. Today, when we pause to honor our moms, that is an expression of thankful love. But these things don't set the standard for love. God sets the standard. It's through him that we know what love is. That's because he revealed it to us. Verse 9, God showed how much he loved us by sending his only son. He told us that he loves us, and then he showed us that he loves us. This is an important characteristic of love, one that we cannot overlook. Sometimes we say, you know, I love people. I'm, I'm just no good at showing it. I'm, I'm, I'm no good at saying it. Guess what? You need to get good at it. Your words and your actions, they need to match up. You need to learn to tell people with words and show people with actions that you love them. In God, we see that real love is a sacrificial love. Verses 9 and 10, God showed how much he loved us by sending his only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. He loved us. 
and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. God's love cost him everything. He gave up his son and his son gave up his own life so that we could experience forgiveness for our sins and receive the promise of eternal life. This was the only way it could be done. When Jesus was facing death on the cross, he prayed, My Father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will, not mine. Matthew 26, 39. It wasn't possible. This was the way that it had to be. Why did it have to be this way? I mean, if God is God, why couldn't he just say, you know, everybody's forgiven without the necessity of the death of Jesus? Well, it's because of God's nature. He has to be consistent with himself. God is holy and just. Therefore, sin must be dealt with. But God is also merciful and compassionate. Therefore, sin will be dealt with according to his generous and loving nature. We couldn't save ourselves, so he gave his son to die in our place for our sins so that we might be saved. He paid a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. That's sacrificial love. It makes our attempts at sacrifice seem rather small, doesn't it? But that's what we must strive to do. Real life sacrifices for the one who is loved. God also sets the standard for love by loving the unlovely. When you chose your spouse, undoubtedly, or at least hopefully, you chose someone of strong character who was faithful and, and had good prospects for the future, someone who was worthy of your love, right? I mean, you certainly didn't seek out someone who you knew to be unfaithful or dishonest or manipulative or cruel or selfish or uncaring. You married the best person you could find. Interestingly, that's not how God chose his bride. He didn't choose to love the best, he chose to love the worst. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners, Romans 5.8. We don't receive God's love because we're worthy, because we'll never be worthy. We receive God's love because he is loving and he loves us, even the unlovely, which by the way is you and I. So this is the example that we must follow when it comes to loving others. We don't show love only to those who are good and worthy. We love even those who are sometimes unlovable, just like God loves us. God sets the standard for what love is. And number two, love sets the standard for what the Christian life is. The Christian life is first and foremost about love. Don't let anyone tell you that it's really about having a particular political view or that it's really about uh, being against certain social issues or that it's really about adhering to a certain doctrinal statement or that it's really about being organized, efficient, and self-disciplined. Those things all have their place, and their place is all significantly behind what God has said is first place in the Christian life, love. As Jesus said in John 13, verse 35, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. We learn from 1 John that love is the evidence for God's presence in your life. Verse 7, anyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And then John draws a line between us and them. Do you want to know the difference? Verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Like we saw in chapter 3, John isn't trying to make his readers doubt their salvation. He's already made it clear that he knows they're saved. He's trying to help them evaluate the message they hear and the actions they see in others. And he goes on to say, verse 20, if someone says, I love God, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is a liar. John is saying, don't listen to those who claim to love God, but who show no love to anyone else. 
If you have been born of God, you have at the very least a kernel of love in your heart. As John 3 tells us, God's seed is in you. And just as you let that seed of righteousness grow, you also let the seed of God's love grow. We have God's love in our life, but we need more. John said, verse 12, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love has been brought to full expression through us. He's saying that the more deeply you love, the more deeply you live in God. Verse 16, God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. Love sets the standard for the Christian life. That's how you evaluate yourself. And when necessary, it's how you evaluate others. Christians are known by how much they love. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 2, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, if I have a gift, the gift of prophecy that can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Do you want to grow in the Christian life? Your first priority needs to be to grow in love. John says, verse 20, if someone says, I love God, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is a liar. For, we, for if we don't love people, we can see how can we love God whom we have not seen. See, love sets the standard for the Christian life. There are some who believe the Christian life consists exclusively of you know, believing certain facts to be true. You know, if you believe A, B, and C, then, then you're saved. But that can't be all there is to it because James says that the demons also believe. See, there's a relational component to the gospel. That's the essential non-negotiable part. Being a Christian comes down to being in a relationship, a relationship built on love, not facts. So believing and knowing and understanding the facts of the gospel are important, but they can't replace love. That's the standard that we love God and we love others. John said in verse 21, and he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. The next question is usually, okay, then how? How do I love others? In the previous chapter, John gave us a guideline. My dear children, let's not just talk about love. Let's practice real love. That's uh, 1 John 3, 18. The NIV says, let's love with actions and in truth. Love is expressed in what you do. You love people by doing good for them. You love people by helping them. We live in a time when hating your enemies has never been more fashionable. I mean, just look at politics. The idea uh, is not just to challenge a candidate's policies and opinions. The idea is to assassinate the candidate's character. By doing this, the one doing the assassination wins votes for their party. And frankly, that scares me. But you know, it also happens in the religious realm. In certain circles, some people openly attack and cut down the church down the street which is not a cult, but a church that believes in the Bible and that the only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ. A number of years ago, I was attending a church, not a free Methodist church, and the pastor was openly condemning the Pentecostal church down the road, which, which really bothered me because I had friends that attended that church. It was a congregation of God's precious people that he was cutting them down. Needless to say, I didn't stay very long at that church. We've been hearing this since we were in Sunday school, and it's still true. We're supposed to love one another. This means at the very least that we're to be nice to others, and it means at the best that we're to look for opportunities to do good for them. You could disagree with someone theologically or politically. Hey, you could even debate with them without humiliating them. And if you do good for that person, you become more complete in your love for God. God sets the standard for what love is. Love sets the standard for what the Christian life is. Thirdly, we need to set the standard for the world to see. 
You know, Christians don't really have a great reputation these days. Sometimes it's because our message is, is really misunderstood. And sometimes it's because it isn't. I think that we have been guilty of emphasizing the wrong things. We are known in the world primarily for what we're against. Sometimes we have a tendency to major on minor issues. You know, in the early days of his ministry, Billy Graham used to preach against communism. And you know, it wasn't long before he realized that he had a much more important message to emphasize, one that transcended political ideologies and spoke to the deepest needs of humans everywhere. We need to direct our message to what's most important. Many people in the church for decades and probably centuries have felt that we are constantly at war with the culture of the day. And I don't know about you, but, but I sure feel this way. The culture or the thinking of our culture is increasingly non-Christian. And so we find sometimes that we fight back against the culture and we end up getting sidetracked and sidelined fighting over what we are against instead of what we're for. So we end up at war with the people of the world instead of loving the people of this world. However, in saying this, we do need to realize that we are at war. But Ephesians 6.12 tells us what we are really at war with. Let me read it to you. For we are not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against the evil rules, rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against those mighty powers of darkness who rule this world, and against wicked spirits in the heavenly realms. We are not at war with people, just like John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Our attitude towards people must be the same as his. We need to get aggressive about showing the world that we love them so that they will know that there is a God who loves them too. There's a lot of things I'm against. I could preach many messages on things I'm against, but that's not what defines me, and it's not how I want us to be defined as a church. Too many people think taking a stand means being against something. I want to take a stand for Jesus Christ. I want to take a stand for loving others. In order for the church to make a difference in our culture, we must love the world as God so loved the world. We continue to learn more and more about the COVID-19 virus. In the early days, they said it was not an airborne virus, so it was not very contagious. Now we know that it is very much an airborne virus, then it is very contagious and very deadly. You know, it's interesting that the Italian word for influenza, or influence, I mean, is influenza. So the Italian word for influence is influenza. So it's interesting that we call the flu influenza, which is extremely contagious. So I'd like to suggest that the church today desperately needs to be a contagious influence in our culture. And we accomplish this by loving others. Maybe we need to spend a little less time telling the world what to think and a little more time showing them what love really looks like. The world's idea of love is, I will love you as long as it's easy, convenient, and that it benefits me. God's idea of love is, I will love you because I am love and because you are precious and valuable to me. Imagine the difference God could make through us if the world perceived that to be our message. Jesus said, John 13, 35, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. This is where the Christian life begins. And it's where it ends too. Loving God and loving people. He's shown us what love is. He's given us an example to follow. And by loving others, he has loved us. We become complete in our love for him. Let's pray. Gracious Father, as we bow together today, and as we think about this passage of Scripture where you talk so much about what love is and that love needs to define us, and uh, and Lord, help us to be a people who 
is defined by love, by your love working through us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would encourage each one today. Again, I pray for the mums out there and for their faithfulness and their love for their children and their families. Lord, I pray a blessing on them this day. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to teach us and lead us and go before us, that you would protect us. And Lord, we just pray that you would help us to grow in our love for those around us, our love for you. So we are your servants. May you express your love to the world through us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.